good afternoon, or actually we're still well well into the morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Benjamin, and today, oh, there's a lot to talk about considering I uh, didn't record last week. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, number one, I have a lot of stuff I actually need to do. Uh, two, uh, I kind of forgot. And number three, I, I, I need a little bit of a break. Anyway. There was also some big, big news stuff that was going on that I wanted to not talk about until afterwards, and the first big one was that the the Democrats were going to vote on their Federalization of Voting Act, which is, parts of it are unconstitutional because the states determine the manner in which, uh, Congressional elections are held as well as uh, state level elections, um, so long as they follow the Constitution, such as not implementing poll taxes, which violates equal protection under the 14th Amendment. There's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so long as people aren't discriminated based off of uh, color, you know, the color of their skin, um, what their chromosomes are, gender. And uh, as long as everybody over the age of 18 has the opportunity to vote, you know, if they so choose, um, there isn't a problem. And by that, basically, you can require them to register and show an ID to prove that they are indeed a citizen. Nothing wrong with that. Because in our country, only citizens are allowed to vote. At least in theory. Um, however, and of course the states are in charge of choosing congressional districts and the method in which they are, uh, uh, you know, drawn. Of course, the bill that the Democrats wanted to push through would have changed that and mandated all states use a commission of some, uh, like an independent or bipartisan commission. Um, which is, again, unconstitutional. It's a violation of Ninth and Tenth Amendment stuff. Basically, states' rights. What does a state have a right to do with regards to its own local jurisdiction? And there was a bunch of other stuff. Uh, It would have, I think, banned requiring a voter ID. And there's a lot of reasons why I think that's kind of actually insulting to suggest because it's always run like it's discriminatory towards black people okay why is it discriminatory discriminatory towards black people well because there's only you know because GOP shuts down places to get them well driver's license counts are you saying they're shutting down DMVs in predominantly black areas if they say yes, I'll say, okay, does a county with 10,000 people in it really need more than one DMV location? Tell me I'm wrong. Now, if we're talking about a city with a million people or, you know, a few hundred thousand people, maybe it it does make sense to have a few locations for that county or city DMV. That makes sense. But if we're talking about somewhere out in the boonies, no, not really. You don't need, you know, 10 DMVs in a county with 10,000 people at just a waste of resources. But then you could, but the other argument is, are you saying that the people you're saying are discriminating against? Are you saying they're not capable of planning ahead? Are you saying they're not capable of planning ahead and going out well in advance to get their IDs? You know, there was a bunch of other stuff in there uh, mandating uh, that states allow same-day registration. 
I don't know. I think same day registration is shady. Because is there really, well, actually, that's the thing. If you can make the justification that their paperwork is going, if their paperwork is really going to be run before they get their, get added to the voter rolls, such as making sure they are you know, they haven't been involuntarily committed, that can disqualify you. Uh, they're not a convicted felon, that can that disqualifies you. All, you know, that other stuff. <laughs> Make sure they're actually a citizen. If you can ensure that that paperwork gets run, I'll, I'll drop, uh, I'll drop my opposition to that. Because, okay, they, as long as they, are qualified to be a voter, sure, okay, that makes sense. But until then, until you can actually prove that that's, that happens, which it doesn't really happen in places with same-day voter registration. Yeah. The, there was also ideas of making it like California's uh, voter registration law, which is basically you turn 18 and are a citizen, you're automatically registered to vote. That's honestly, that's not the, that's not as bad a law. That's not as bad as conservatives make it out to seem. And honestly, I'd, I'd be okay with that because at the end of the day, it doesn't really affect turnout. It just makes it easier for people to be like, you know what, I feel like voting in this election. You know, low propensity voters. But, you know, there's a lot of other stuff in there that I was a little bit skept that I'm skeptical of because it, it doesn't sound like it's all about voting rights. It sounds more like it's just about... punishing the GOP, really. And you could say it's a response to some Republican laws, specifically in places like Arizona and Georgia and Texas... Which, those laws are not as bad as Democrats claim, in the slightest. Banning people from going door to door to collect ballots to drop them off. What an insane violation of people's rights. Yeah, okay. Let's explain how that really works. What it is, is you have partisan operatives going door to door, collecting people's ballots, checking them to make sure they voted for the right candidate, and then turning them in, either changing the vote, or discarding the ones of the people who voted for the candidate with bad social credit. That's how that practice really works. I see no reason why banning that practice is a bad thing. You and if you and if somebody can't get to a post office to turn it in because they're handicapped or something, well you can send someone there to take that person. There's nothing wrong with that. Get out the vote drives off and have, you know, busing people to polling stations. How do you think college towns get students to the polls? The local party says rents a bus or, you know, gets people and says, do you want to vote? And they're like, yeah, okay, I'll vote. Here, follow me, I'll get you to the polling station, you can vote, and we'll bring you back. There's nothing wrong with that. 
It's what happens in between saying, hey, do you, do you have your ballot? Yeah, thanks. I put that in the bag. Okay, we're going to take this down to the polling station and we're going to drop them all off. What happens in between those two things, you know, collecting the ballots and dropping them off, there's no accountability. So it kind of makes sense that there should be accountability. And because you can't have, have that accountability without a massive invasion of privacy, and because that sort of practice has immense potential to be corrupted, because there's a ton of power involved in that. It's better to, you know, prevent that from happening. You know, as Stalin once said, it's not who votes that matters, but who counts the votes. And if you're already manip manipulating the count before it even gets to the collection point, there's a problem. And that's not democracy, that's tyranny. There's a few other things in that. Obviously, the Democrats couldn't get over the Republican filibuster. So they decided that they were just going to nuke it uh, on this occasion. And uh, Chuck Schumer uh, filed a motion to have the filibuster removed for this type of legislation. And man, both Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona uh, said, no, we're not doing this along with all 50 Republicans. <laughs> and why does this matter? <clears throat> well, Democrats lack any sort of understanding of consequences for their actions. They do this now. The GOP is going to look at it and say, oh, you wanted to nuke the filibuster then? Yeah, okay. Uh, file a motion to uh, get rid of the filibuster completely, and then they're going to completely get rid of everything the Democrats do, and they're not going to have anything to stop them from doing it. And if the Democrats thought four years of Trump with two of them having a Republican trifecta was bad, imagine that with no filibuster. Because pretty likely right now that the Republicans are going to gain control of both chambers uh, in November. And of course take control of them in January. And right now, it is not a sure thing that Joe Biden is going to uh, be reelected. let alone... I think he's going to run. I still maintain that. I think he's going to run for re-election. But it's no guarantee. He is almost as unpopular as Trump was at, at a similar point in the presidency. And honestly, Biden's doing a far worse job. And anyway, Joe Manchin... He just doesn't want to nuke the filibuster because he doesn't believe in doing it. And Kirsten Cinema is a bit more pragmatic about it, but is also just in general against it. And her reasoning was actually the you think you think you hated it during the Trump years? Wait till the Republicans can do whatever they want without anybody to stop them. And instead of Democrats praising Manchin and Cinema, uh, there's calls to primary them now because they're not far left enough. And that's a problem. Because if the Democratic Party is not willing to have moderate people who are able to break with the party on key and critical issues like this, that indicates that the Democratic Party 
is not a diverse political party, as they claim it is. And we're going to use this to get into the next portion, portion of the video. They're going, you know, the Democratic Party is not a diverse party. It's only diverse if you look at things that truly aren't as important as people make them out to be. It's only diverse if you look at gender and race. And if you look at diversity of thought, it really isn't. I can pull a Democrat off the street at random. And I can probably tell you exactly what they're going to support. They're going to support some version of a national health service. They're going to support some version of an assault weapons ban and light and gun license registration, you know, gun licensing and gun registration. They're going to support some form of abortion past viability. They're going to support some form of intervening in how states conduct their elections or as they would call it, voting rights. Um, they're going to support some form of modifying the Senate. They're going to support some form of court packing or modifying the Supreme Court in order to get rid of its judicial independence, though they would call it unstacking and unpacking the court. Um... And by that, I mean they're going to support things like either adding justices to the court, uh, term limits for justices, and various other things that uh, make the court that would make the court more partisan than it is. Anyway, using that, whereas if I can pull a Republican off the street, there's a, actually a surprisingly high chance that there's going to be difference of opinion. <laughs> how much government spending should there be, you know, or how little, as it may be. Yeah. Because the Republican Party can have people like Mitt Romney, Phil Scott, Charlie Baker, Larry Hogan, Glenn Youngkin, Ron DeSantis, Herschel Walker, Tim Scott, uh, Christy Noem, you know, like, think about how diverse of a political, you know, debate that is. That's why Republican debates are far more interesting than democratic debates. You know, the primary debates of both parties, right? The Republican Party presidential primary debates are far more interesting because there actually is a difference of opinion. It isn't a race to see how, you know, how conservative can you be? It's a, what sort of conservative are you? You know, and why do you believe this works? So that's why we'll have Rand Paul squaring off against Chris Christie. Or Chris Christie calling Marco Rubio a robot for saying the same speech over and over again. Whereas the Democratic primaries is just a contest to see how far left can you go. So anyway, other big news, uh, the Ukraine situation, all I'm going to say is somebody who has a degree in history and is technically a trained historian, the stuff I'm reading in the news reminds me way too much of the summer 
of 1914, as well as um, some of the stuff during the mid-1930s, particularly after 36. We should have learned from Neville Chamberlain that appeasement does not work. Anyway, and in other news, a court, a federal court, uh, struck down Alabama's congressional map because it did not create enough majority black districts. Now, I've done the best I can to try and create two majority black districts. No, it actually isn't really possible. And just as proof, we're going to flip it like that. And the problem is... This is not acceptable for con for a congressional map. It just isn't. Um, could I trade some of Mobile for some of this area and shift some of the population from the first to second? Yeah, generally. But in my opinion, it's really not a good idea because what do Birmingham... Birmingham and Mobile have in common? And what do they in particular have in common with this rural agrarian part of Alabama? If you answer not a damn thing other than the color of their skin, you'd be you'd be mostly correct you would be very, very, very correct on that. Um, Birmingham. Large city with a decent service industry and actually a, a, a very diverse economy as well. Mobile. Well, it's a port city. It's a big tourist destination. And its economy is nothing like that of Birmingham. And then, of course, you have that very rural part of Alabama that's thrown in the district simply because of the color of the skin of the residents in that area. So you have three di very different communities being lumped into one district under the Voting Rights Act. Because... Uh, skin color matters in voting. Black, you know, black voters only want black people in office, you know, only want to elect black people. Well, no, that's, that's not really the case. It's good for minority communities to have representation, but it should be the representatives that they personally choose. And there are better ways than just simply looking at the percentage of a district's residents who are of a certain race or ethnicity to determine whether or not they have representation or whether they're being, you know, unfairly discriminated against through redistricting. It is actually possible to do that. And it doesn't make sense to split Birmingham or Jefferson County for that matter. It doesn't to me because that is a community that has a single interest. It doesn't make sense to split South Alabama like, like this map does. It doesn't make sense to have a district snake all the way from the, you know, the very small part of the Appalachians that uh, Alabama has, you know, up in this area, all the way down to the Gulf Coast almost, you know, to the lowlands, and to, it doesn't make sense to me. And the reason for that is simply because at the end of the day, There's a lot more that factors into, you know, whether or not a community has representation than just skin color. Are they part of the same city? 
yeah, okay, if they're part of if if a group of people live in the same city or county, it makes sense. Uh, for example, Baltimore is just a touch on the small end to be a congressional district, but Baltimore would be a perfect congressional district if you included you know some of the most similar suburbs to the city. Yet in Maryland's congressional map, in order to quote protect the voting interests of the black residents of Maryland, they split the city up. Uh, and I think there's like four congressional districts within Baltimore, uh, within the city of Baltimore, that that have a part of the city of Baltimore. Is that really protecting the interests of Baltimore's voters? Is it? The other thing is. By doing this, you get rid of any sense that there might be a competitive election for Congress in Alabama. I mean, as much as there isn't a competitive election right now in Alabama for Congress, you're definitely ensuring it here. And in other states, if, say, uh, This would be considered racial ger. This type of map would be considered racial gerrymandering for packing all of the uh, packing all the black voters into one or two districts. It's just, it's not a good. Yeah, it, I, I think it's just wrong, but okay. And if we look at Arkansas, there's a potential that they may try to, that someone may try to sue to get them to create a majority black district, which I think actually may be theoretically possible. This one just barely misses out. Just barely misses out on it. And if we uh, go ahead and look at it, um, it will be the first district. I could probably figure out a way to switch some precincts around in the fourth to get it to work out but yeah it's and again you would get rid of the idea that there might be a competitive election in Arkansas I mean there aren't any as it stands but you'd be getting rid of it of that idea So, yeah, it's it's just, in my opinion, not uh, not really what you um, it's not really right to measure a gerrymander simply based, you know, to measure a congressional district based solely off of uh, whether or not voters in a district, a certain percentage of them are this color or that color. It doesn't make sense and I don't think it's right. And obviously these maps aren't very compact. And the best way to think about compactness and doing it like that is just a case of um, are you splitting up counties and cities? Or are your districts snaking all over the place? But, yeah. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed and I hope that uh, I kind of covered all the stuff that I missed and 
explain why this sort of thing is not exactly an ideal way. I think there are better ways to measure uh, discrimination in regards to the drawing of congressional districts or state legislative districts. But I'm not exactly sure the best way to go about doing it. You know, actually writing that out in law. Anyway, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you all next time. Take it, very, take it easy. And I'll see you all next time.